Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Eva and Bertrand for inviting me to speak here today to you about T cell lymphomas. So um, the WHO classification of mature uh, T cell lymphomas includes a number of different entities. And just for simplicity's sake, they're broken up into nodal, extranodal, uh, leukemic, and cutaneous. So today we'll be focusing mostly on the more common nodal subtypes, including PTCL, NOS, angioimmunoblastic, and a plastic large cell lymphoma. Uh, the rare subtypes, again, have uh, more specific therapies, and most of these are uh, not that common um, in the West, whereas uh, NK T cell lymphoma and HTLV-1 are obviously more common in the Far East and in Japan. So uh, just in terms of the overview for aggressive T cell lymphomas, the NCCN guidelines in the United States uh, make a distinction uh, for patients who have a low um, IPI as well as early stage disease. Those patients are patients that can be treated uh, effectively with chemotherapy uh, and involved fear radiotherapy if appropriate. However, all of the other patients who have, um, actually, I'm seeing a different slide here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ann. To go to this one. OK. I'm trying to use the pointer. So um, I guess the pointer does, doesn't work here. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you. It's too early. I'm jet lagged. <laughs> I'm still in bed, actually, back in Connecticut. Um, so again, early stage patients, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, um, and they're pretty much done with the algorithm. Patients who have uh, higher um, IPI or more advanced stage disease, clinical trial is recommended uh, or multi-agent chemotherapy. And then if they respond, they may go on to a transplant. And if they don't respond, they fall into the relapsed refractory group. Um, so in terms of thinking about these patients, IPI is an important factor in terms of knowing what to do with these patients. And we know that in the PTCL uh, NOS group that IPI is important. Those early uh, stage patients or those patients with a low IPI have a fairly good survival compared to those with IPI 2 or greater. Um, there's um, also another fa um, prognostic score that we use called the PIT score. I don't have um, a slide to show you, but that does include bone marrow involvement as well. You can see that the median survival for IPI 2 or greater is in the order of 30% or less, so not very good. Now, in terms of other prognostic factors, um, one disease that we um, have um, some prognostic uh, factors that are um, important in the past and some new ones now is anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So traditionally, we always thought about ALK as being an important prognostic factor of patients with ALK positive disease doing much better than those with ALK negative disease. Um, and this has been a paradigm that's carried through uh, until very recently. So people have said that, well, gee, there are some ALK negative patients that actually don't do um, uh, that poorly. So additional prognostic factors that have been identified are these uh, uh, molecular factors, such as DSP, um, DUSP22, and TP, uh, this should be 63. Um, and so these are two uh, genetic um, aberrations that have been shown to have significance uh, in these patients with ALK negative ALCL. So if you're DUSP22 uh, positive, you can see that your outcome is just as good as those patients with um, ALK positive ALCL. Whereas if you're a TP63 positive, um, or if you um, are, are negative, uh, ALK negative, um, then you can see that these are very poor prognostic factors. So right away, we actually can start screening those ALK negative patients for these two genes, and we can identify a group that is going to do well, and perhaps that group doesn't need to go on to a consolidation transplant in first remission. Um, NCCN guidelines don't really tell us what the best frontline therapy is. A lot of these are CHOP-based regimens uh, or more aggressive regimens. Uh, again, there's no study in the United States at least addressing uh, what the best frontline regimen is. However, there have been a couple of um, studies that we'll talk about. So if you look at uh, the five-year overall survival rate uh, based on historical data, this is all retrospective data, I mentioned the uh, about 30% uh, median survival for many of these subtypes, uh, PTCL and, and angioimmunoblastic. Now there's a couple of, uh, of newer uh, prospective studies, uh, the, the German study uh, being one of them and the Nordic study being the other. Um, and those two uh, studies are shown here, the German and the Nordic. Um, and the question is whether we're actually doing better um, in current days with current chemotherapy regimens, better supportive care, et cetera. 
So you can see that the five-year overall survival uh, is now uh, a little bit higher, about 47 to 50 percent uh, for these patients. Um, so one of the questions that we always have in frontline therapy is, uh, should we use CHOP, should we use etoposide, uh, when do we use etoposide? Um, and I don't think there's a clear-cut answer to this question yet, but this is the German data, uh, again, where they had patients receiving either CHOAP or CHOP. Um, and what they showed when they went back and looked at their T-cell patients is that patients who uh, were younger than age 60 had a benefit in terms of event-free survival um, and patients who were out positive. Uh, so again, these are patients that out positive are going to do well anyway, um, but perhaps in the younger patients we might consider the addition of etoposide. When looked overall at the other subtypes, including um, uh, the more aggressive T-cell lymphomas, PTCL, angioimmunoblastic, there was no statistically significant difference. However, many of us look at this data and say perhaps in these younger patients we might incorporate etoposide. Uh, the whole question of the uh, benefit of anthracycline was raised, raised by the initial um, retrospective study by Julie Vosen Group, which showed that etoposide, per, uh, which showed that anthracycline perhaps doesn't have a benefit. Uh, so a number of people have looked at this, and again, these are all retrospective reviews. In this case, this is a review of 442 patients. Uh, different subtypes are shown here. Um, these cases, again, were retrospectively reviewed, and some of the path wasn't available. Um, the clinical features were retrospectively reviewed. Many of these patients were over age 60, uh, and about half of them are still alive. Um, a small number had early stage disease, and the majority did have anthracycline. So what they're looking at here is the benefit of anthracycline. Um, and when they looked at anthracycline versus non-anthracycline, this is for all patients, and this is for the PTCL and angioimmunoblastic. You can see that they did show that there was a benefit in the um, the p-values are shown here. So the, again, they did show a benefit for anthracycline, but remember that only 20% uh, of the patients actually did not have anthracycline-containing regimens. And if they didn't have anthracycline, the question is, well, really, why was there something about the disease subset or the patient? Uh, the anthracycline, reg the non-anthracycline regimens are shown here, and they include a number of different things like CEOP, uh, GEMOX, PEGS, et cetera. Um, and again, the non-anthracycline group did have more high IPI patients, and again, some of these might be those rare subtypes. So I think uh, interesting data, um, but again, hard to interpret like any retrospective data. So what about other uh, frontline regimens? We, we have some um, studies that have been published with non-anthracycline regimens, and this is a French study where they used um, uh, a different kind of upfront chemotherapy, um, VIP uh, or ABVD. Um, and they compared it to CHOP21, and they actually showed that it really wasn't any better. Another one that was done in the United States was CEOP, uh, alternating with pralotrexate, so using the etoposide without um, anthracycline, um, and then alternating cycles with pralotrexate. Um, and this study, um, actually, you can see the progression-free survival curve here. Uh, this study was hoping to get more patients to a complete response. That was the endpoint of the study. But it really turned out to be not any better than uh, CHOP alone. So other um, uh, approaches for upfront, uh, this is uh, Bertrand's uh, study that's ongoing looking at uh, incorporating romadepsin with CHOP upfront. So this, again, is a randomized study. Uh, the phase two study was done um, incorporating these two agents together safely. Um, and the phase three study is ongoing looking, again, at whether the addition of an HDAC inhibitor upfront is going to be better than CHOP alone. So um, the use of transplant, as I mentioned, is, has become a standard in the United States, and the question is really is it indicated in all patients, and I think we don't know the answer to that yet. What we do have are two uh, studies that are prospective studies of upfront transplant, the Nordic study including etoposide in their regimen and the German study with a CHOP-based regimen. Uh, the German study used TBI uh, as opposed to BEAM for conditioning, and you can see the number of patients are shown here. If you look at the overall survival and progression-free survival in these two different series, it's, it's fairly similar, um, and the progression-free survival curves are shown here for the different um, subgroups of patients. And I think the take-home message here is that this approach at best is benefiting about half of our patients, not benefiting the other half. Um, and again, we don't really have clear indicators as to which group of patients are benefited the most using this approach. Um, now, looking at the use of anthracycline, again, that retrospective study I talked about, they looked at anthracycline treatment and stem cell transplant. Uh, and you can see on the top here, this is anthracycline plus stem cell 
This is anthracycline without stem cell, and these patients are non-anthracycline. So um, there was a benefit to the use of anthracycline um, in patients who went on to have a stem cell transplant. The majority of patients uh, did not get a transplant, though, and that's the, true for many of our studies where most of our patients don't have an adequate response and can't move on to actually get their transplant. Um, and so the non-transplant group and the non-anthracycline groups are small, and it's hard to really draw firm conclusions from this, except to say that, again, there is a group of patients getting anthracycline and also getting stem cell transplant that appears to have a meaningful outcome from this approach. Um, other studies have looked at autologous stem cell transplant. This is another meta-analysis looking at a lot of different studies, uh, patients undergoing transplant and first remission. And what they're concluding is that there's a trend toward an, um, an overall um, survival benefit in the patients who got transplanted. Um, again, all this is based on retrospective data. Uh, another thing that was somewhat questionable when they looked at these patients is that there was no difference between a CR and a PR in terms of overall survival, um, and that patients with low IPI obviously did better. I don't think that in the, in the current era that many of us would um, send a patient who's not a CR to an autologous transplant. So other, retros uh, other prospective studies in the front line include uh, alemtuzumab combinations and the brentuximab plus um, the CHOP-based regimen, uh, again, another randomized study. Um, and there's um, the, the HDAC inhibitor plus uh, CHOP, both the romodepsin study I mentioned, also there's a bolinostat plus CHOP versus CHOP study uh, that's initiated. So um, other frontline approaches, including some, uh, some phase two studies that are underway, using romodepsin again with lenalidomide up front based on uh, studies that have already been done combining these two, um, and then romodepsin plus ice, which was presented in part by Michelle Finale, um, and as well as other uh, regimens uh, combining other things and comparing to CHOP. So there is an effort to try to get these new uh, agents up front. The clinical challenges are still trying to move away from CHOP, uh, looking at the benefit of transplant uh, and defining that further based on the subgroup of patients um, and uh, ongoing studies by Dr. Corradini et al., looking at the upfront use of aloe in some patients uh, with poor uh, prognostic features. Uh, there is no randomized trial comparing transplant to maintenance therapy. Uh, people have talked about that study, and perhaps that will come in the future. And also, there's not yet the stratification based on molecular features of the tumors. So just flipping now to the relapsed and refractory setting, the NCCN guidelines recommends uh, that we consider whether or not a patient is a transplant candidate. And if they are a transplant candidate, there are a number of different choices, including combination chemotherapy regimens, as well as some of the active single agent regimens as well. Uh, if you're a not a transplant candidate, you can see that most of the uh, recommendations are the single agent therapies, again, trying not to expose these patients to very aggressive cytotoxic regimens uh, if there's no endpoint for a cure. The uh, FDA-approved therapies are shown here, uh, romodepsin, pralotrexate, brentuximab, and now bolinostat. Uh, and this is just a, a nice summary looking at the overall response rates across the board for these. And if you eliminate brentuximab, which is, uh, this is the study for um, uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma patients, if you eliminate that one, you can see that the overall response rates are really very similar uh, for these agents with perhaps some difference in response duration favoring uh, the HDAC inhibitor. Uh, and again, you have to look at this, these studies. They weren't, um, uh, they had slightly different groups of patients, although most of them were relapse and refractory. But what it basically shows us is signals of activity uh, among these uh, different agents. And whether or not there's uh, activity in specific subgroups of patients um, actually has been looked at, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, this just shows you progression-free survival um, in these patients, pralotrexate, romodepsin, um, and bolinostat. And again, I think these curves look fairly similar um, with brentuximab, bedotin obviously being uh, more favorable in the anaplastic patient. Uh, now, um, another issue is using autologous transplant in relapse patients. Um, and this um, study from CIBMTR just shows you that um, most of these patients um, actually went to allo in the relapse setting, although there was, were some that went to auto. And interestingly, the outcome really wasn't any different between auto and allo, perhaps due to the um, patients who died from the allo-related complications. Um, and in Stanford's experience, they show you that patients who had um, CR2 
uh, did better than patients who were refractory uh, in the setting of autotransplant uh, in relapse. Uh, allotransplant's been used primarily in the relapse setting, and again, uh, these are data uh, showing you um, overall and progression-free survival, and again, about half of the patients seem to benefit from this. They tend to be the ones that have not been very heavily pretreated. Um, now, I mentioned brentuximab, adodin, and anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and we all know that story, but it's been looked at in the other subtypes as well uh, with angioimmunoblastic PTCL, uh, and NK patients included in this study. Um, and you can see that the overall response rate um, was 50% in uh, anaplastic, uh, in uh, AITL patients, uh, whereas it was 25% in PTCL. But look at these small numbers of patients. Um, I think we still need to actually look at it uh, in larger cohorts of patients. But it is a, an agent that can have activity uh, in some of the other subtypes. Uh, and this just shows you uh, the progression-free survival uh, for the patients with the other subtypes compared to those with uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Again, some patients are benefiting from this approach, uh, still need larger numbers of patients to know for sure whether we should be using the drug in these other patients. Um, Prolotrexate is the folate antagonist, and I mentioned the overall response rate of 31%. Uh, there did not appear to be many responses in patients in angio with angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma, um, and that will be significant when you actually look at romadepsin. Uh, romadepsin did have more responses in AITL patients, um, and likewise with bolenostat. Um, now, the um, bendamustine has also been shown to be an active agent uh, with a 50% overall response rate, but progression-free survival, again, is not really good. So this uh, agent is being used in combination with some of the other newer therapies. Another new agent is Aurora kinase inhibitor, inhibitor alicertib, which actually had response, uh, responses in T cell patients in the early studies with B and T cell lymphoma. Uh, it turns out that four of eight patients with aggressive T cell lymphoma um, had uh, very nice responses. And so this went to a multicenter study, randomizing it against investigator's choice, gemcitabine, romadepsin, or pralotrexate. Um, that study has accrued a significant number of patients, uh, and data is being analyzed right now. Um, you heard about PI3 kinase inhibitors. Uh, we talked a lot uh, about uh, idilolizib, uh, but the one that's been used um, in T cell lymphoma is a PI3 kinase inhibitor, inhibitor that affects both the gamma and the delta um, kinases, and that was um, IPI-145. Um, and in this study, uh, in the T cell lymphoma subgroup of patients, you can see that there were responses in aggressive T cell lymphoma as well as in cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Again, numbers are still small here, but it does suggest clinical activity, um, and the agent is moving on in combination studies. Um, so my last slide just talks about uh, where we're going with aggressive T cell lymphoma. We still don't have an answer to the upfront CHOP um, question as to whether there's a better regimen, whether new agents combined with CHOP will be um, good enough, or whether we need to get some of the novel therapies up front. Obviously, a lot of us think it would be good to develop the novel therapies in doublets and triplets. In addition, now we have some new mutations and potential targets that we can focus on. Um, I didn't have time to talk about it, but there's a lot of work now looking at um, angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma, identifying TET2, NM, um, uh, DNMT3A, and also ROA as important mutations in angioimmunoblastic, also to a lesser extent uh, in patients with PTCL. Uh, ROA uh, being expressed in um, al almost all of the angioimmunoblastic patients and about a third of patients with PTCL. IDH2 has also uh, been shown um, to be important in AITL, and there are agents now directed against IDH2. I mentioned uh, DUSP22 um, in uh, patients with anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and also there are studies looking at FIN um, as well as other kinases and uh, JAK uh, mutations as well. Um, and a lot of these are um, uh, druggable targets, and so um, what we're now, now trying to do in T cell lymphoma is look at some of these novel agents specifically addressing uh, the genetics of the tumor. Thank you.